Another notable trend in the railroad industry is the adoption of PSR. All but one of the Class I railroads have adopted or are in the process of adopting PSR. At its essence, this is a fundamental shift in how railroads operate. The move in the industry towards PSR has been accompanied with significant job cuts in the past few years. Class I railroads and Amtrak employed 163,220 workers in April 2019 versus just five years ago when industry employed 194,790 workers, a 16% reduction. I want to welcome everyone here this morning to the hearing of the Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials Subcommittee. We'll be looking at the state of the rail workforce. Railroads and the men and women who make them run are a key component of the American economy. According to the Association of American Railroads, in 2017, major U.S. railroads supported over 1.1 million jobs, $219.5 billion in annual economic activity, and $71.3 billion in wages, while creating nearly $26 billion in total tax revenues. In my home region of Northeastern Illinois, six Class I railroads interact along with multiple short lines, while Metra and Amtrak run hundreds of trains over these same tracks. The confluence of all these railroads make Northeastern Illinois the rail hub of North America. The more than 160,000 rail railroad workers in this country are the backbone of the industry and keep our world-class rail system the powerful economic force that it is. In Northeastern Illinois, thousands of workers get 1,300 Metra, Amtrak, and freight trains to their destinations on a daily basis. There's no doubt that without the men and women who are on the front lines, the industry would not be the success it is today. Historically, in return, the railroads that provide good paying jobs with good benefits for their workers. It's important that this continues. Today we'll hear from a number of witnesses about the widespread changes that are taking place in the railroad industry and the impacts that these changes are having on the rail workforce. Two of the significant changes we have seen recently are longer trains and the adoption of precision scheduled railroading, or PSR. These changes in rail operations have raised concerns about working conditions and safety, as well as negative community impacts and the quality of service being provided. Freight railroads are now running consistently longer trains, upwards of 10,000 to 15,000 feet. That equates to two or three mile long trains, or to put it another way, 33 football fields. However, the rail infrastructure has largely gone unchanged. This has led to operational challenges, such as increased block crossings or idling on mainline tracks for extended periods of time. Uh, you know, before uh, he stepped down as uh, executive chairman of BNSF, Matt Rose gave an interview with Railway Age, which I would recommend that uh, anyone interested in the future of the industry read. And uh, when he was asked about the value proposition of his railroad, Rose noted he looked at the value of the railroad as a three-legged stool, one leg being shareholders, because they provide the capital needed for reinvestment in the railroad. Second, employees, which provide the services that allow us to make the return to provide to shareholders. And the third leg of the stool is customers. Unfortunately, uh, thanks to uh, Hunter Harrison and uh, his destructive actions at CSX, we seem to be entering into a new uh, era of railroading where railroads think uh, only less is better. And the three-legged stool is now down to uh, kind of a peg leg. Uh, and this is not long-term sustainable or supportable. Uh, you know, I worry that the railroads are cementing uh, in his uh, legacy, squeezing out more and more profits for shareholders or um, you know, the uh, rapacious uh, Wall Street hedge funds at the expense of long-term investments back into the rail network. Across nearly all the Class I railroads, we're seeing a reduction of capital, maintenance investments, labor costs, and service, all for the sake of reaching lower and lower operating ratios 
He called it precision scheduled railroading, but what are the consequences to hedge fund investors bringing out every possible dime from these railroads? Shippers, uh, we're hearing more and more, and we will hold a next hearing, I believe, of this subcommittee um, with shippers to hear of their frustrations. It's not more precisely scheduled uh, for them. Uh, it's costing them uh, time and money. Uh, just last month, the STB held a hearing to examine Class 1 railroads' increased use of demurrage and accessorial charges to shippers. The hearing brought to light concerns that service has not improved for shippers with the implementation of PSR, but in fact, they're often having to bear the financial burden of these operational changes to profit the people on Wall Street. And then we look at the consequences for the workforce. Thousands of freight railroad workers have lost their jobs. In just three years, CSX has cut its workforce from 26,000 down to less than 20,000 since May 2018. UP has reduced its workforce by 3,000. These aren't just executive or administrative jobs. Their jobs are represented by some of the witnesses sitting uh, before us in the next panel uh, today. Engineers, conductors, yard masters, uh, signalmen, uh, you know, signalmen now are required to, uh, at uh, UP, instead of 20 miles of track, 60 miles of track, uh, which uh, for many is a physical impossibility. Switch, bridge repair, maintenance workers, car and locomotive maintenance workers. These are jobs that help ensure a railroad can expand its service and continue to operate safely. On the passenger side, Amtrak's cutting jobs too, not because it's beholden to hedge fund investors, but because of this notion that someday it will have an operating profit. Um, to the administrator, I mean, how long can a train be? I have trains now running up the Willamette Valley that are 15,000 feet long, going through city centers. Uh, how long are we gonna allow people to block emergency vehicles? Uh, there's, these are mostly at grade crossings. I mean, is there any limit to how long they can make these trains? There is no limit as far as what you can make a train regulatory. There is no limit that I'm aware of in timetables of railroads. However, railroads are very cognizant of what the physical plant will accommodate and what, what will be accommodated safely in its transversing of the route between points A and B. Right, but what about, uh, you know, the rest of the country, the people who live in these cities? Uh, who need to get back and forth across a track, uh, emergency vehicles are blocked, there's a hospital on the other side. I mean, you can run, I mean, don't you think there should be a practical limit on the length of trains uh, that both serves the railroads for efficiency, but not their optimal PSR or whatever the hell you want to call it efficiency, uh, but uh, you know, and, but also uh, is cognizant of the burdens placed on the rest of the people of the United States of America. Chairman DeFazio, okay. ordinarily it's not unusual to see trains operate with... 15,000 feet long? I haven't heard of that before recently. You'll, you'll see trains ordinarily in the range of 7,000 to 11,000 feet. Right. There are, have been exceptions where there's trains that have now grown to 15, 16,000 feet. The interesting part of it is, yes, the linear length of the train is more, without a doubt. But the number of freight cars in that train have only increased by 10 cars in the last 45 years. Yeah. So the integrity of that train, as far as mechanical reliability, Right, but that's not the not, question. It, it, that's not the question well, I raised. The question I raised is the impacts on society of what they're doing, well, let alone the issues that are being raised by shippers and everybody else. I mean, how far are we gonna let, I remember when Frank Lorenzo ran Eastern Airlines. We finally drove him out of the business because of what he was doing. But we're seeing the same thing here, started by a guy who's now deceased, uh, that, is, that is infecting the railroads and making them subject to these inordinate pressures from Wall Street. And isn't there a point at which you're gonna be concerned about the safety by the reduction of the number of employees and about the inconvenience for the rest of the United States of America because these, these companies are driving these trains as long as they can with as few people as they can? I mean, you, you don't have any concerns about this. You think this is all just hunky-dory? I've had sincere commitment to safety 
since the day I was employed in the railroad industries in 1971, right up until the day I retired, and I still carry that commitment to safety. Great. And you believe all these reductions the train, the in, in, train, in workforce are warranted and not jeopardizing safety in any manner? Train length. No, I'm, we're not talking about length anymore. I'm now talking about the number of employees who have been uh, you know, dismissed, laid off, so they can increase their bottom line. Well, we certainly have incurred change. There's no doubt about it. When I hired out in 1971, we had around 700,000 employees. Mm -hmm. We're now down to about 100. Okay, so you're, you're basically going to say this, no, is, let me, this is all just fine and we're being driven by Wall Street and you're happy with that? No, I'm not happy. Okay. I'm, t I'm trying to share with you the facts. Well, the fact is I'm going to what Matt Rose said and the concerns he raised because I thought that he was doing a hell of a job and they aren't doing these things and they're serving their shippers better because they aren't being dr driven by jackals on Wall Street because they were bought by a responsible long-term investment firm. And for what it's worth, Matt and I share similar opinions. Okay, well, then you should have some concerns about this PSR stuff. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman.